Frame Raider. Now and then I'll come across something weird when shopping for games. Oftentimes I walk right by it, but sometimes the game's cover either seems very promising, or maybe it just had a really funny title. Usually unintentionally. Fear the D sure has a different meaning now. I recently realized that I've collected so many games and there's not a chance I could ever get to making a video about each one. So I've started thinking about package videos to cover a subgenre, like strange games I own. I think it'll be fun to take a brief look at some of the more unusual games I have in my collection. So without further ado, let's start with Lawnmower Racing Mania 2007, because it was in the thumbnail. So this is a game I picked up for $1 at a GameStop once. For a while there, I kept finding old PC games randomly show up for dirt cheap. I have no idea what that was about. Anyways, in Lawnmower Racing Mania 2007, you race on, you guessed it, lawnmowers. So like, was there a Lawnmower Racing Mania 2006 or 2008? Doesn't seem like it. So what happened in 2007 to make Vivendi Universal agree that this was indeed a game that should be published and sold retail? This was the same time they had rights to Crash Bandicoot, mind you. Oh wait, we uh, don't really talk about that era of Crash Bandicoot, do we? So the game starts up with this prompt. Let's see here, default detail level. Ah uh, yes, let's go with PC with cutting edge 3D video card. Hopefully my computer can run Lawnmower Racing Mania 2007 at full specs. Frankly, I don't know why they put that there. Come on, the audience is just a bunch of cut and paste BMPs. I have many regrets. Okay, stable circuit, free mowing, multiple players. I have more regrets now than I did seconds prior. So you need to qualify first to enter the race. I quickly found out you can do a little bibbity bobbity boop as you drive, so you'll pretty much see me doing that in all the footage. So we're off to the races. I have to get at least third place to unlock the next map. By the way, the game has literally just one set of options for each mode by default, which is suckish. Can't even change my uniform color. And we have liftoff. So yeah, this mower controls really badly. I can see why this isn't a popular sport. Turning is kind of, well, it's bad. Good. Yeah, even better. You know, I just noticed that I've been playing terribly and yet I'm still in position 5 of 6. What the heck is going on with player si uh, Oh. How did this happen, player 6? How did this happen? Holy sh- Nice try. I mean, sure? Oh, oh dear lord, what- <laughs> Who's that driver? When did they get stuck? What is this crappy zoom? Wait, wait, no. Don't think you can just hide that on me. What just happened there on the left? Holy sh! I'm sorry. Oh, this is what I get, huh? I'm stuck now. What do I do? I can't get out of here. I can certainly jam out, though. Oh, finally, I'm free! I what the heck is going on out here? Hold up, hold up, no way. Not only did this happen again, but two racers are now stuck on bales of hay. No, three racers! Hey, wait a minute. This gives me an idea. Oh, uh, thanks for the jump start. <laughs> no, get back here. Okay, one down. That's two. Apparently first place finished already, but hey, I'll settle for second. Beaten only by... Mojectile. Alright, so now I have access to the second map. Good thing I'm a fair and just competitor. The second map is far more interesting. It isn't just one big circle. Okay, I'm not sure how a near full 360 flip was possible there, but it happened. Wait a minute. Players already got themselves stuck. It's the first lap. I think I'm done with Lawnmower Racing Mania 2007. And no, there was no Lawnmower Racing Mania 2008. I found out there was a website for this game, and noticed an Xbox port was planned, or maybe even finished, but I'm at least 80% sure that did not happen. Alright, so what game's next? Well, I guess we'll keep looking at those in the thumbnail. This here on the left's Michael Jackson's Moonwalker game. It's kind of hilarious. So is the Genesis port I own. It's less of a port, more of its own kind of thing. Did I mention that at the end of the arcade game, Michael turns into a freaking jet? I'm far more familiar with that game than this port. I haven't really played the Genesis game much. It's kind of like Hotel Mario. It's not a comparison you can make often. Anyways, you show up at a club that I believe is the same one from the Smooth Criminal music video, but this time you're freeing children from closets. This is an alternate universe, of course. Alright, personally, I don't believe all that MJ controversy stuff with kids and whatnot, so don't read me wrong here, but it is really easy to make jokes about that regarding this game. I'm sure the dude is innocent, though maybe I'm a little bit biased because I'm a huge fan of his work. 
You ever seen the Moonwalker movie? What a trip that was. Barely remember it besides it was very odd. Was there even a plot? I don't know, but anyways. Straight into the game you've got an options screen where you can set the music that plays. You got Smooth Criminal, Beat It, Another Part of Me, Billie Jean, Bad, and... Ow? I don't remember an MJ song called Ow. Well, let's check it out. Mmm, <coughs> so this is just a sound test then. Why does it say music? I'm about to do something real sacrilegious. <coughs> God! For some reason, if you press the up button, Michael does this. Hey look, I made him sit on the chair. Why am I amused with this? Thank you, thank you. Then I found out you can press the down button for Michael to do this. Holy crap, Michael, did you just knee that poor lady in the gut? Good god, this piano sure is dusty. Oh, jeez, I'm so sorry about that. Oh, 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 I just, oh, I can't watch. I was wondering where that sample was gonna kick in. Michael. You spin me right round, baby, right round. Ra uh, what's going on? Oh, okay, that's pretty cool. No, come on, Michael, don't. Michael, don't. Michael, don't! Fun fact, I own this game for that scream and that scream alone. Though the game is actually pretty good. The idea is strange though, because it's supposed to be James Bond, but a fish. James Pond. I guess one thing you can say is it plays positively nothing like a James Bond game. You're just freeing underwater captives. No stealth or nothing. Still, it's actually a really fun game that I'd easily recommend. That's all I have to say about it, besides there being a couple sequels. One of which seems to have hit way too many platforms. This Robocod game? It's from 1991. It still gets physical releases to this day. Look, it recently came out retail for the Switch. Why? I don't know. To waste resources? Very eco-friendly, James Pond. I guess we'll finish off the strange Genesis games here. This is Duke Nukem 3D for the Mega Drive, or Sega Genesis here in the West. This low-production, semi-bootlegged game came out exclusively in Brazil. Is it unofficial? Well, kinda? There's been a lot of banter about the legitimacy behind licensing Duke or not for this release, but whatever the case, this is not the Duke you know and love. Actually, it's an entirely new set of levels based on the game's second episode, Lunar Apocalypse. This was allegedly produced in the Zero Tolerance engine, which is another Genesis FPS game, though there's yet to be any definitive confirmation to that claim. I think a lot of the confusion behind this game is a result of it coming from Brazil. I mean, the back of the box has no English on it whatsoever. The game is in English though, oddly enough. The game's rights were picked up in 2014 by Pico Interactive and redistributed via cartridge in 2015 with some extras, like a crosshair. Why? That's anybody's guess. Availability, maybe? The original is stupid rare. The game is really an impressive feat for the hardware, but you're not here for that. I have a review of this game on my channel if you're interested, but I get it, you want strange. So let's get back to the strange. I've got some odd Atari 2600 games, and that should be of no surprise to you since the graphics were so simple, you kinda had to either use your imagination, or you'd have to come up with some bizarre yet familiar concept. Like, why did the chicken cross the road? I still don't know the answer, but hey, now you can take the role of the chicken yourself. If you get hit by a car, you'll flutter backwards a bit. You know, having a chicken get run over, a bit too violent. Except the prototype for this game was called Bloody Human Freeway, which did not have you flutter backwards, but no, instead turn into a giant pile of blood! Then there's Plaque Attack, your tube of toothpaste or fluoride or something, shooting down a bunch of food to prevent it from decaying your teeth away. Not sure why or even how the person's been swallowing entire unchewed hamburgers. It's just symbolism. As said before, you gotta use your imagination. The game itself is actually really fun, but it gets very hectic over time. One thing I dislike is how when pressed up against the top or bottom of the jaw, the tube automatically faces the opposite direction. Can't tell you how many games I've lost due to that. Wait, are those cherries? Strawberries? What's wrong with eating fruit? Anyways, it ends the same every time. You're left with a mouth filled with emptiness as your teeth have entirely rotted away. That's another thing. These games rarely had an ending to them. So it was just a game of see how long you can survive. Or rather, how many points you can get before the game ends. This stuff is really old now, and maybe you have no interest in Atari games, so how about the GameCube? This system had a whole bunch of oddities. Of course, I don't have a library full of strange games for it, but I've got a few. Starting with Ribbit King. In this game, you play golf, but with frogs. 
It's actually one of my favorite games, close to the top even. The biggest flaw it has going for it is probably the lack of maps, though I will admit there needed to be a skip option for other computer players' turns. It was likely done in a way to make the game feel longer because otherwise, in terms of gameplay, it doesn't come with all that much. What is here, though, is spectacular. You wouldn't think this to be as fun as it really is. Besides the concept of golfing with frogs, another oddity in this one would be all the wacky cutscenes. Particularly on the second disc with unlockables you get for progressing in the game. I assume a different division of the team made these, otherwise development was definitely shifted in a very strange and unnecessary direction considering the lack of content gameplay-wise. These unlockable cutscenes are... something? They are quite charming. Gives you something to come back to, even if just to unlock more of these. One weird thing I noticed about the game is this robot penguin Sir Waddlelot seems to have no idea what he's doing on the third hole. He flings his frog directly into this carousel every time you play this level. His prior moves don't make much sense either. I feel like they changed the map late into development without attributing the differences to this character's pathfinding. But anyways, I strongly recommend giving this game a go, especially with a friend and all the maps unlocked. You can also get special items and new frogs that add new abilities, it's great stuff. Now here's a game I bet you weren't expecting. An actual sports game? This game is balls to the wall absurd and I love it. <clears throat> I need a can over here to spit in, I've got a lot of phlegm today. Oh, that's good. That's really good. Jimmy, let me borrow Why your don't handkerchief you for a minute. Why one right out of the boot? I'm not gonna... No, no, just, what, no, just for a second. Come on. We'll go in a bathroom. Today's game, the Toronto Blue Jays will go up against the Toronto Blue Jays. They actually let you do this. The game is actually loads of fun. Not only does it follow the traditional format of baseball, it adds hilarious nonsense that thankfully doesn't affect the game too much. Well, uh, some of it does, but it makes sense. Like if you throw the ball at a batter, on occasion they'll literally burst into flames and, uh... And he rushes them out! Out! Oh! Jimmy, give me the smelling salts. I'm going down. You can also flat out punch players from the other team on base, and that's always appreciated. I can't forget to mention the animations. It's just so absurd. The absolute liberties they took with this game. And you wouldn't know it from the cover or anything. We pretty much got this game out of luck. They also have a sister series, NHL Hits and NFL Blitz. Never played them. Probably should though, if they have any of the fun factor this one has. There were a couple sequels to Slugfest. I never picked them up though. Maybe I should. And Wells with a hot dog move for the out. You ever eat pig knuckles? No, I haven't, but they sound tasty. Two outs, nobody on base. Raises Hell. Raises Hell was stuck in development hell for many years prior, going through a number of changes but ultimately settling with their idea sometime in 2003. In this game, you're trying to save your village by removing the invading threat of Culets, a cute race of Teletubby-like creatures hell-bent on eliminating all things ugly from the world by the order of their deranged princess. Being a cute killer as a concept alone would probably wear thin fast, Thankfully, the guys at Artec knew what they were doing, and gave the game a whole lot of personality. There's six plus hours of one-liners encoded into the game for the Kulin enemies. Oh, you make me want to spit. I'm not sure how many actually register in-game, since I did occasionally hear them repeat certain ones. Nonetheless, the whole Kulin society is just so bizarre and over the top that you can't help but love it. What do we need the mortars for? I thought this was a construction project. Well, you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs. What the hell is that supposed to mean? You can't wage a preemptive expansion of war without some incidental collateral damage. Why didn't you just say that? My biggest complaint is the lack of a focus on the race of the protagonist. The whole point of the game is to save your people, yet we learn so little about them in the first place. My motivation to save these guys is slim. Hell, sometimes I'd even run into them myself just for fun. Who needs them? This violent game is a bit of a stress reliever and is always fun to revisit. Unfortunately, it didn't sell well, and thus we never really heard from the team post-release, other than some community get-togethers assembled by the team behind the game. You can tell this game was their passion, and while by no means perfect, it deserves far more credit than it gets. Which is funny considering the game was received very well both by critics and gamers alike. It's just very underground, which seems to be the definitive factor to it being relatively unnoticed. Though I'm sure being an Xbox exclusive when the system was on its way out probably assisted in that. Probably the strangest thing about this game is the fact that I own so many copies of it. Here's a game I own for some reason. Battle Construction Vehicles. Clearly this is just some kind of weird parody game, right? Uh, I think so? Though considering the game has a storyline, character development, and a romantic subplot, I'm not sure? It's a really weird mix of both taking itself seriously and not taking itself seriously. It's very anime inspired by its visuals actually has fully animated cutscenes that are fun to watch. Honestly, the unfortunate part about all this is that the game itself feels like the filler, which should be the other way around. Combat is clunky and unresponsive. Worst of all, it's kind of boring. 
The only thing I looked forward to when playing it were the special attacks, which just made no sense whatsoever. A lot of this game makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah, I can't really justify a reason for this to exist. I also can't justify how in the heck this misprint exists on my SOCOM PSP game. Yeah, I'm kind of shoving this in here, but I didn't know how else to bring it up. So basically, somehow, someone messed up and placed an early childhood logo on top of this game, and copies managed to not only ship, but be totally available to purchase without being recalled. I mean, sure, no parent on their right mind would pick up an early childhood game with a depiction of war on the cover, with guns and, you know, war stuff. There's a sneaky teen logo emerging from the EC logo, which is what the game is supposed to be rated. This is the greatest misprint of all time. The following is not a misprint. Yep. I'm not gonna say too much about this one because there isn't all that much to really say about it. You just explore a bunch of strangely abstract open areas and occasionally run into some inhuman monstrosities. Otherwise, it's just a walking simulator? An interesting idea for a game, but I doubt you'd want to play this more than a couple minutes. There just isn't enough going on to justify sitting through it. What might be weirder to you than this game is the fact that it's being emulated on a Dreamcast with what was known as the Bleem emulator. This game for its original hardware is super expensive and only released in Japan. Also abandonware. So I felt no shame in downloading a disc rip and setting it up to work with a Bleem PlayStation emulator on my Dreamcast. Yes, there is a mind-blowing PlayStation emulator for the Dreamcast. It has its own wacky story behind it, but that's been talked about on YouTube many times now. I believe LGR has a good video covering the topic. Kind of a weird way to go about playing this game, emulating PlayStation on my Dreamcast, since I could just emulate it traditionally or put it on my modded PS3, but I mean, it's a game about LSD. Might as well just go all in on the weirdness factor. Speaking of my modded PS3, here's a game that doesn't play very well. Disney's Extreme Skate Adventure. Yep, Disney pretty much made a Tony Hawk ripoff game with their own properties. Not today, Zerg. Another game I can't really think of a reason to exist, but it does, and I love it for that. Anyways, my PlayStation 3 emulates PlayStation 2 games, so it doesn't play each game flawlessly. This is one of those examples where it's pretty much unplayable. Still, just wanted to let you know that this is a real game that exists. Before anybody mentions it, I'm well aware of Toy Story Racer. In my opinion, that's far less strange, especially since kart racing is basically its own subgenre now, and every character ever created needs to have their own, it seems. While I've got the PlayStation up and running, let's take a look at my weird PlayStation 1 games. Biofreaks. No, it isn't just Biofreaks, it's Biological Flying Robotic Enhanced Armored Killing Synthoids. I wish I was making that up. It is the not-too-distant future. Here, the mighty country known as America has fallen. Rip America. This game was planned for an arcade release, but was cancelled and only got home ports instead. As you can probably tell, this is a fighting game, which I must admit pretty much rips off Mortal Kombat's announcer 100%. Battle 3 Fight. Although Biofreaks does have some unique aspects to it that I haven't seen in earlier games of its type, you've each got a sort of jetpack which is not that useful, but it comes in handy. You've also got a long-ranged attack, usually some type of gun. Your weapons of destruction are capable of removing limbs and causing a big bloody mess. Not just that, but if you lose something important like your arm, you lose whatever ability that limb possessed, like if you were holding a weapon or something. That's gone now. In terms of a moveset, it depends on what character you choose. They all have their own attacks and defenses. Gotta admit, the quirky characters feel like the only redeeming factor in this game. Okay, okay, the game itself is kinda fun, but I don't see how you're supposed to learn it. It's brutally difficult, and in terms of a tutorial, the only thing you've got are short on-screen text splashes. I think the game's a severe case of lost potential because the art style is so distinct and memorable, at least to me. Though each time I picked it up, I'll shortly stop playing because it just frustrates me. Also, the PlayStation 1 port is very jagged and doesn't look all too nice. The N64 port is where it's at. No one can stop Mr. Domino. Kind of at a loss for words with this one. It's a pretty cool puzzle type of game where you get a set course to place dominoes about. Upon making a lap, you can come back to those dominoes and knock them down. There's other stuff going on too, though I have very little experience with this one. This recording is the first I've ever played the game. It seems like fun, if a bit repetitive perhaps. I like the idea, but can't help but feel that maybe the concept of a controlled domino could be used in a better format, like maybe a 3D platformer. Imagine that, a game based on dominoes inspired by the works of Rube Goldberg, embracing that chain of events concept to its full capacity. I'd jump on that in a second. Here's another idea of a game that I'd jump in on in a second, and that is exactly what I did upon finding out about it. Graffiti Kingdom. You can design your own characters in 3D space and use them to fight baddies around this RPG-focused game. Unfortunately for me, I'm not much of an RPG person, but I got what I came for more or less. I just wanted to make my silly characters walk around, interact, and punch stuff. It's like Drawn to Life, but in 3D, and before Drawn to Life was even a thing in the first place. 
The game is a plot to follow and cute characters that I find charming. Though however many years ago I first tried this game, I gave up on it rather quickly because I couldn't find out what to do. And to be honest with you, the combat itself, which is a pretty big focus for the game, is... Well, to put it bluntly, it's just bad. I'm sure someone could get loads of enjoyment out of this title, but it's just not for me. Form your own opinion of it. What was made for someone like me is Serious Sam 2, despite I do find it relatively weak compared to what came before it. Serious Sam 2 is a very strange game, taking the series in an absurd direction with ridiculous enemies, weapons, one incredibly bizarre plot, and, well, possibly the strangest thing about Serious Sam 2 is the dialogue and cutscenes. You can tell the game tried very hard to be funny, and sometimes it is. Other times, well, it has a lot of potty humor. That's pretty bottom of the barrel. Still, this is one of the craziest first-person shooters you'll ever see. It's a horde-based game like, for example, Doom 2016, if you like that sort of thing. So maybe you'll like this? It's a controversial one for sure. The tone and level design is very otherwise unfamiliar to the series, so I'd say don't judge the series as a whole on this one alone. But there is a decently sized community of people that love it, so maybe you can add to it. Dragon's Lair is a well-known Laserdisc arcade game that's glorified for its beautiful art and infamous for the brutal difficulty. What you might not have known is that it has a port to the Game Boy Color. And I know what you're thinking. There were other home ports of this game that did their own thing. This? This is actually a conversion of the arcade game to the Game Boy Color. Think of that! A fully animated video game on the Game Boy Color! It even has digitized speech! How'd they manage to pull this one off? Well, by essentially pixelating probably every second frame and shrinking it down to the incredibly tiny resolution of 160 by 144. You might be shocked, but the frame rate is quite good here. Hopefully they got a computer to do all the conversions because by hand, or mouse, or whatever, this would have taken forever to do. You'd think a lot of measures were taken to limit this to the hardware, but I feel they took advantage of everything they could to make this work. This is very impressive, and totally strange. It all feels like some type of flip note animation. On the Game Boy Color, it's pretty much beautiful, though the digitized speech is kind of, uh, painful to listen to. For whatever reason, I never hear anyone talk about this port. It's by all means strange, but I also wanted to bring it up because it seems to be extremely obscure, yet it's so amazing. Well, those are all the strange games I own, as far as I'm concerned. Oh wait, there's one last thing. World at War was the first Call of Duty game I actually purchased. I had played it before, but I really wanted to try this new Zombies mode the world was going nuts over. I ended up loving this game so much. In fact, it's my favorite Call of Duty game to this date. I decided to pick up the Collector's Edition just as a nice little trophy piece to affiliate with my love for the game. I didn't really care what it came with, but what it did come with is just so beyond me. A canteen that doesn't open, just a big piece of metal that sits on your shelf. I mean, cool, some people might like this, but enough to justify being the only authentic giveaway in a Collector's Edition? Why? It's just so bizarre! Alright, well, that's everything now. I enjoyed looking back at these games and collectibles, because I really love both obscurities and oddities alike. This video checked all the boxes, which made me pretty excited to put this all together. I'm sure I'll come across more strange games, but if anything, that'd be for the future. So for now, I'm just gonna leave it at that. Thanks for watching, everyone, and remember, stay strange!